So we went through this example, and uh, the example was as follows. If you received a thousand dollars every year during four years that you're here, we calculated the present value of those thousand dollars in these And then we accumulated them and calculated the sum. And I think we got a value of $3,487. And then I think I asked Dan here in the class, what does that value mean? And that gave into a position. I said, well, that, that value could also be interpreted as if someone gave you that money and you invested it at that interest rate of 10%, you would have $4,000 after the 10 years. So that's what I said yesterday. If we take those $1,000 coming in and we calculate the present value, something about to get $3,487. I said, that, that could also be interpreted as if you've got a lump sum of 3487 and you invested it at 10%, you have $4,000 after 10 years. What's wrong with my statement? Could you calculate, in fact, what is 3487 invested at 10% compounded over four years?
time value of money rate, which is 10 percent here, and assume that you're going to be left with the sum of the particular inputs. That simply comes due to the fact that we're getting compound interest on it. So I want to just to be clear on that one. The next thing um, I just wanted to, to mention is we've got assignments handed up in front here. So a few of you are handing in paper. That's okay for this assignment. Um, a number of you are um, handing in electronically. That's also that's also great. So just on this personal finance assignment, um, I asked you at one point to state some sources of information. Another one that I forgot to mention in the tutorials was uh, this magazine, The Economist, is, is phenomenally well written. Uh, just from a good writing point of view. Um, but also what's useful is right at the back page of the source of information, it lists all the financial indicators for different countries of the world. So GDPs, consumer price indexes, and interest rates. So here, for example, you can see right now in the United States, the interest rate uh, that you could earn on a 10-year government bond is 1.6%. So that gives you a feeling for the time value of money. In the United States, 6 Canada is 1.76. Uh, Greece, Greece, if you bought the government bonds, you could be earning a whopping 21%, right? 22%. Okay? If you wanted to invest in Greek bonds, if you wanted to invest in Pakistan bonds, you could get 11%. Venezuela, 12%. Pretty much all of South America is in 6 to 7 to 12%. South Africa, 6%. So it gives you a good feeling for the current trends right now. Um, especially for those of you working for companies who are spread across the world. Probably most of the other thing is that's nice about this is that its macroeconomic uh, description is written at a very entry level. So if you want to understand economic issues and how they impact the rest of the world and Canada as well, that's a, that's a good source. You don't need a background in economics to understand it. It's written at an entry level point of view. They explain concepts when you need So another good source of financial information for every day. Okay, so today's class then, what we're going to do is we've, we've looked at the past two, three days, the time value of money now. Where we're heading to next is to understand profitability measures. And this is going to lead up into being able to estimate um, or make, make decisions rather between alternative investments. So we're going to use these profitability metrics to help make these comparisons later on. Um, so what we require is a systematic way of, of comparing expenses. That's what we're on. <coughs> we're going to introduce the concept of a, of a minimal acceptable performance, not in today's class, but uh, in a few classes from now, we'll look at a minimum acceptable performance. So as long as we're doing as good as that minimal performance or better, we'll go ahead with that investment. So most companies, they will have an internal benchmark, and it varies from sector to sector. So oil and gas, pharmaceuticals versus high-tech research and development, they'll have different internal metrics that they use. And as long as when you develop your profitability metric and it exceeds that measure, they will tend to choose to, to invest in that decision. Um, if it's obviously below that minimal asset performance, then that company will, try, will rather spend their money on other projects or just hold that cash for, for something else. So there's multiple options here. We're, what, remember, we, we've emphasized so far in the time value of money, the relationship between P and F the relationship between present value of money and future value of money. What we're essentially saying there is we're, we're able to exchange future money for present day money. Okay, so we're, we've got a mathematical way in which we can relate that. And so that comes very much into the decision making process. A company can choose their money that they've got right now in the bank. They can choose to invest it in a project and exchange it for future revenues so we're then calculating what those revenues are, are and taking into account the expenses that we'll have to invest to, to achieve those revenues. That's one option. The company can choose to park that money in a bank account and earn a set fixed rate of interest. So that's an alternative that they have. They can choose to give that money back to their shareholders if, they, if, it, if it's a surplus. So there's a number of 
of options that they could do. Or they could just park that money as cash in a bank account, not even choose to invest it. Just keep it as cash, totally liquid in, in the need of paying for a lawsuit or salary increases or some sort of investment that they need the money for right now. So the need to be able to assess fairly and um, make a decision, a comparison, is, is really necessary. And what you'll find that's quite interesting is that most companies defer that decision to the engineers. They will actually give the engineers a phenomenal amount of, of uh, leeway in choosing certain investments because they're the most technically competent to make those decisions. So the choice between implementing or, or buying a new distillation column and installing it versus outsourcing it to another company versus installing packing into the column to improve the throughput, those are not decisions that the finance or marketing department can make. Nor would it be the CEO, whatever her or his background is. It is the engineer's responsibility to make those decisions in most cases. You present your results then to the finance department who will look through it and, and, and come to uh, some agreement with the engineer. <coughs> but it's often the engineers, or most, as I've seen it, the engineers who are most uh, responsible for developing these, uh, these measures of profitability. So, so it is important that we understand how to do it. And what we'll find here is this, we'll look at four measures in this class. Um, there, are, there are some other alternatives as well. But there's two that are most commonly used and are useful. There's another two that we'll have to start off with that are widely used, very widely used. Who's heard of return on investment? Who's heard of payback time? Okay, these are two terms that are widely used, but they're not recommended. And we'll look at why. The two that um, should be used more widely and are used by engineers and, and do tend to get used a lot by companies, especially the bigger companies, uh, we'll look at also. Maybe not in today's class, but certainly on Tuesday's class. Um, there is also this, this issue of whether Nonprofits should consider the use of profitability metrics. Are they appropriate? So, for example, would it be, would these measures that we're going to look at, like payback time and return on investment, be useful for some something like the university? How how might McMaster University use these measures? <coughs> Major expense, 80% of McMaster's university expenses are salaries. So McMaster University is operating budgets $900 million. So the university spends between two to three million dollars a day just to keep the place running, and 80% of that goes to salaries. But there's a big chunk of that that goes to other capital items, and for example, the decision to rent versus buy computers in the lab in the labs. That would be a typical financial decision. So even in non-profit environments, we can use these measures. If you work for a charity or were involved in a charity, how might these metrics be used? What sort of decisions are faced by charities? Advertising, outreach, fundraising. So they could look at alternative fundraising approaches and make a decision on which, which do we do a direct mail campaign or do we do a phone, a phone campaign. So even nonprofits such as charities could use as governments could make the decision on whether to outsource a particular um, piece of work or whether to do it in-house. So right now the Canadian government's going through a big uh, issue in the media through the purchase of the F-35 fighter jets. Is that something that the Canadian government should have outsourced to Lockheed Martin, or as there's a very recent beginning in the media, should we have started to develop those expertise in Canada to develop these fighter jets and stimulate the Canadian industry rather than outsource it to um, the United States? Uh, so governments could also make these decisions. In a, but even chemical plants or uh, engineering companies that are for profit, how would something like a safety issue? focus in a profitability analysis. Should we even be using these tools when it comes to an uh, uh, issue of safety? So if a 
company, for example, identified a deficiency in the safety of one of their, their operating units, and there's now three or four alternatives to improve that safety, should we even say that we should go ahead with, the, with this, these sorts of metrics? It doesn't seem right to be using pure economics <coughs> to judge on safety or environmental issues. Risk rank in combination with this, Sean? Okay, so shut down or improve safety. Or you could find a project that meets the safety requirements and is the most cost. So at a minimum, you meet the safety, and then in addition, you look for the lowest cost after that. So you, your safety becomes a constraint, and then your choice of project is to optimize the dollar spent. Yeah. The way it was told to me when I was working at my plant, it was, we don't care if you're going to pay you to sit in a room and just play games and watch YouTube all day, but you're not allowed to get hurt as a student engineer because it hurts their reputation more. It's really bad to say. So you'll often, that, that's becoming more than all now as a company has become extremely strict on safety. In the past, they would take shortcuts. Right now, it's, uh, we're in an environment where that's not, well, it's becoming less acceptable to do that. So all these issues, uh, of profitability, even for non-profits or even for issues that, that typically seem like money should be no object, um, sh uh, the issue of profitability is still a very strong focus. Okay, so here let's take, a, we'll look at this example and, and use it throughout the class uh, today. <coughs> there's five periods here and there's an initial expenditure of money at the front. So $91,000 or $93 spent on a particular project. And if we're using time value of money of 15%, we have, we're asking here, should we invest in this project? Should we sink those $91,000 up front in period zero, and then we're going to receive future net inflows of money of $20,000, $30,000 thereafter, and $30,000 in the final year? Maybe that 30000 is the salvage value of, of um, closing down the plant and selling the red product piece of equipment. So it's a, it's a short term project. We sink 91000 we get some money, and we salvage some from selling the plant at the end. Is that a decision we should go ahead with? Take a look at those numbers and just what would, would be your gut feel just looking at that? Is that a worthwhile investment? Just uh, no, no. Calculations with the calculator. Just uh, just look at those numbers. Is that worth it? Yes. Yeah. No, I need an explanation now. I think that's what we're, you're all mentally trying to do, is you're trying to accommodate time value of money. But let's suspend the fact that there is time value of money. Is that a good investment? For sure. Okay. Because within a short time frame, <coughs> these revenues over here are going to pay back those some, those some costs, and we're going to be left with some, some positive number at the end. So we're going to make profit. At the very least, we're going to make some money. So that's, that's, that's what payback time is. Um, it's a very quick way of, of looking at something and making a judgment on profitability. Um, 
pay out times and sometimes cold for cold. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the point in time, either in months or years, where we turn a profit. So where our cumulative cash flow reaches exactly zero. So it will usually be in the middle of a period. It's unlikely to coincide at the edge of the period, but it will be at, in the middle of most times. And in this course, uh, we're not going to consider interest. In, in most cases, payback time is considered without interest. Okay. You can consider interest, and I will have a tutorial question on it. You'll look at the difference between if I did take uh, time value of money and interest into account versus not. But for the most part, people look at payback time without taking time value of money into account. But most people do this, for example, when they're purchasing a car. Um, they look at the expenses and then how quick can I pay it off? Even though that payback time is over three, four years, you're not really taking the fact that time value of money is declining over those three, four years into account. So you're just looking at how quickly can I pay it off. Okay. So determine when the payback time for, is for that investment. Let's do it with the person next to you. Calculate quickly. What is the time frame roughly when that investment pays back? and then choose the project that pays back faster. The reason why this is not a reasonable approach to use is we're not obviously considering the time value of money into account. So especially if a project goes out for many years, that time value of money really does have an effect further out. If you're doing it for a very short time frame, two years, three years, and your time value of money depreciation rate or uh, rate of decline is, is a small percent, so 2-3%, you could get away with, with that. But over a project of any appreciable duration, that estimate of payback time is going to get worse and worse. Okay, so here's another example, uh, a project that's getting 91,000 per year original investment. It's going to give you an annual profit of 34,000 after the first three years. The payback time can, can quickly be estimated as 2.7. Similar numbers to the example we just looked at here. 
The other thing to realize is that if you make no investments, the payback time is zero. Okay, so that's a bit of a stupidity because it's saying that um, you can get instantaneous payback for no investment, which we know is not the case. Um, but then there's, there's a, few, uh, a few other things to realize here. The reason why time value of my, um, sorry, payback time is used so widely is because it's very easy to understand. Uh, the person who you're speaking with there has really will not understand time value of money at all, which, um, which is often the case in, in many companies. It's easy to calculate, is another one. So simple, simple expenses, and then you add your revenues back and you see when you cost zero. But the other thing is to realize is why payback uh, time is such a poor metric, and you should never use this, not in your course project here, and not in, in, in when you're working for a company either, is the fact that it a lot hinges on the timing of those payments. So if I go back to those that diagram here, um, if I ask you, well, would you rather have this, this form of income, or what if those two $40,000 incomes in year two and three were combined as $80,000? Okay. Your timing of your payments then is going to influence, influence substantially, and, and more so when you're going out, out into the future. And timing of payments is critical in companies. So cash flow is, is what makes or breaks uh, many projects. So the, the, the choice of that timing of that, that money flowing back in is, is going to really strongly affect your payback time. Um, and then, of course, the most serious factor is, and this is where we'll look at this in the tutorial, is, is of course this relationship between your present value and your future value. Those future values that we're, we're receiving here, 20,000, 40,000, 40,000, and then 30,000, we should be discounting them back to the present day. So we should be dividing those future values in the end time period by that denominator. And that denominator gets larger and larger as we go out into the future. So really that $20,000 here is, is closer to, say, 19. That 40,000 is getting to 35. That one might be 30,000. That one might be 27,000 and so on. So we should be discounting those future cash flows and bringing it to present day terms and making our summation. We'll, we'll have an exercise on that in a minute. Where we do that. So, the, the, the lack of time value of money in, in a payback time is what, what really kills us as a useful metric. So please don't use payback time. But unfortunately, this is something that everyday people use a lot, and in, even in companies, so the rough rule of thumb, they use this. It's not a good metric. Okay, so let's return on investment is another one that people tend to use. So let's, let's understand this one as well. Um, let's take a look at this calculation and then we'll discuss a bit what the terms are going So it's a straightforward return on investment is a percentage. So it's the annual profit I will make, so the average annual profit. So we're just looking at a, at a time frame of the year here and averaging out the annual profit we receive divided through by our capital expense, so the cost of the equipment and the working capital. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about working capital in a minute. So it's a percentage that we receive per year. Now, the, the reason why people like to use this is because it is quite understandable. I mean, if, if someone said to you, this project is going to have a 15% grade of return. So that's one, one statement. The other statement that they may say is, that the net present value of this project is ten is hundred thousand dollars. Which one? Which one sits well easier? With you? So if, if someone, so if a colleague in the company said to you, "This project has a fifteen percent return on investment," and another person said, "Well, this other project has a net present value of hundred thousand dollars," like what? 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 Do those statements mean which which one of those two projects would be picked? Can you compare them either? No, you can't. And the thing the thing is, people tend to go with the one 
they find the percentage interpretation a little easier. Where we hear percentages a lot, we have a good feel for it as well. So if someone says this, the project has a return on investment of 10, 15, 20%, whatever it is, we can, we've got an intuitive gut feel that higher is better. Um, and, and as long as it's over a certain number, say 5, 10%, we might say, well, this is a great investment. But the NPV statement is a, is a dollar figure. Okay? And we're going to look at that one as a, as a third measure of possibility. That one is a little harder to interpret, um, especially if you don't have a baseline on what to go, to go against. Whereas the return on investment, anything of, over a certain threshold seems to, be, seems to be okay. So people tend to go with the ROI as a, as a measure. But there is um, one other thing to, to use and help with the ROI is we need an estimate of what's called working capital. Okay? Working capital is the difference between current assets on hand minus current liabilities. Okay. Any idea of what working capital actually is made up of? Anyone got a feeling for it of what the terminology working capital is? Guys from the finance courses, management. Uh, what goes into working capital? Cash. What sort of numbers? Uh, cash. Cash receivable. Cash on hand. Short-term accounts receivable, so um, current assets minus current liabilities. Short-term accounts receivable, so you're talking about people who's like 30, 60 days. Yeah, like you know, like a, yeah, 30 days or something. Like yes, I don't know if that's working capital. I think that's a current, that's a asset, current asset. Yeah. So working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So it's what's left over. It was not accounted for in either of those two. So I don't know if, I, I would have to check that one. I'm not 100% clear on that one. Anything else? What is it that companies, if, you, if you're operating, um, let's take a look at something that, that would be quite easy for us to understand. Okay, a restaurant, for example. If you are operating a restaurant, you've got capital items that you put, stoves, fridges, cutlery, plates, tables, napkins, etc. These are, um, or maybe not napkins, plates, cups, knives, forks. These are capital items that you use in your company. In a chemical plant, this would be your equipment that you have on hand. Okay. The restaurant has to purchase, what sort of things does a restaurant have to buy and have on hand? Food. Okay. Right. Alcohol, food. What are these items intended for? Okay, so they're going to prepare them and sell them next day, today, tomorrow, maybe a week from now, alcohol, maybe a year or two from now if it's a wine cellar. Okay. So these items that are purchased but are held on hand temporarily, not being worked on yet, that's part of your working capital. So it's your raw material inventory. Okay. So in a chemical company, these would be things like raw materials. That you have on hand. Okay, this wouldn't this example doesn't extend too well to a restaurant. But uh, what about a chemical company that's produced a product already but hasn't actually shipped it to the customer? Inventory. So inventory is another part of working capital. Working capital, 
capital is money that you need on hand to pay for short-term expenses. You may need to pay cash on hand for labor to purchase these raw, raw materials, um, and then the inventory that you have on hand. So there's a, there's a few other things that apply to chemical processes, catalysts and supplies that you have on hand to, to, um, to make your product. So supplies, consumables, Finished products that are in storage that we still own, so inventory, cash on hand to cover short-term expenses, and work in progress, so material that's halfway finished. So it has some value, but it's not, you haven't completed it. So work in progress. The key point of working capital to, to distinguish it is anything that can be recovered when the plant is shut down. Okay, so that's why uh, when people were mentioning uh, short-term uh, uh, receivables, and current assets, I don't know if that's considered working capital. Um, but I guess it could be to some extent, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on what exactly the accounting rules are. That's actually, it is an issue when we're looking at engineering economics, is we have to be competent in accounting terms and accounting terminology, especially when it comes to depreciation and taxes, which we'll touch on uh, quite shortly. Uh, so it, it could be frustrating for you at, here in this class that, but why do I have to understand what working capital is? Why do I have to understand depreciation and taxes and short-term current accounts and current liabilities? The reason is simple. You're going to take your proposal for a new process or for an upgrade to your process and have to convince the finance people to, to release the money. And they're going to be asking you, well, what's the impact going to be on our current assets? What working capital do you need for this process? We're going to have to be comfortable with this terminology. So um, it is important that we can communicate with the people who are, who are the people that uh, release the dollars at the end to allow us to go ahead and spend. So anything that we have to purchase, our raw materials here, work that's in progress in our plant, while well, it's inventory that's in storage, until that product is in the customer's hands, that's working capital. So what we'll, we have to do is when we calculate ROI, fixed capital is, is relatively easy to estimate. Working capital is a much harder number to estimate. What is the amount of material we need to purchase and inventory we need to have on hand to keep our company going? Consumables and supplies that we will need during startup. That can often be a substantial dollar figure. Uh, what are the supplies we need to start up this chemical process um, and to working capital? When you say supplies, like you're storing or manufacturing, so you have one of the catalysts, uh, we had a bunch of machines that we could also use for production, but they're just sitting around, we don't use them at all. Would that also count as supplies or no? No, I consider that a capital. These are items that you're, paying, you're spending money on, you're going to depreciate, and you're going to then sell at a salvage value at the end. Whereas working capital, these are consumable parts that you use up. So, um, you could, uh, that's why I said in the restaurant example, for example, napkins could be considered a working capital item. It wouldn't be considered a, a capital item. Because you're consuming this as you're going through your day-to-day -day activities. So uh, a, a restaurant is actually a good example to have in the back of your mind here in, when you're looking at some of these, these numbers. Is if you could imagine, and some of you may end up opening a restaurant one day, what are my capital items? What are my fixed capital costs going to be? What is my operating expenses and cash flows over the period of time I'm going to operate this, this business? Um, so don't just think of this as you're doing these calculations for some other corporation. Think of it very much as you could be doing these calculations for your own uh, business that you want to, to, to work on. Again, the problem with working capital is it doesn't consider time value of money, which is the big problem with, with using ROI as a measure of profitability. So here's a, here's a simple example. If we had that project with $91,000 of fixed capital, assuming no working capital expenses, our denominator then is $91,000, our numerator is $34,000, that's our average annual profit. After, um, so if we take those, those cash flows coming in, our average annual profit over those amounts is 34,000 divided through by the $91,000 of expenses. 
get to your ROI of 24 percent. So the problem there is we've not taken time to use a Yeah, yeah, we're going to get to the problem. Yes. So uh, the next example that I'd like to introduce is we'll get to NPV more formally next class, but I'm going to take a look at this example on the board and then we can calculate these metrics. <laughs> so consider a process where we have the following. Expecting revenues of seven hundred and fifty thousand in periods two, three, and four. So uh, the first part is uh, what's the payback plan? though is, is, is heading to where we're going to be on Tuesday, and that is calculate the present value of all cash flows in now. So we've got cash flows out in the first two periods and cash flows in in, the, in periods two, three, and four. What is the present value of those cash flows? So you can you should be working on this now, actually. And then the, four, the then we'll sum sum those present values. Sum the present values to report the, the total present value in period zero. Exercise, let's use um, the time value of money.
minus 500,000. <coughs> Period two, we're getting some inflow of 750, so they were up to minus. And then in your third period, you're exactly even at zero. Your payback time is exactly the start of the third period for this contrived example. Okay, payback uh, present values of the cash flows in and out. When we, when we ever, when you consider questions like this, it's uh, it's, it's helpful to work the table. So uh, the first row would be your period number, and then your your cash flows, and then your present value, and then from that you can calculate your future value. Uh, sorry, your, your your cash flows, and then you calculate your present value. So in period zero, we have minus five hundred thousand. And the present value of that is minus 500,000. In the first period, we then have minus a million dollars expend expenditure. Present value of that. Yep, okay, so minus 952,381 at, at a 5% time value of money. Period two. Now we have an income, a net income of 750. There may be expenses. Uh, there's income maybe greater, but the net of the income and expenses is 750. So the present value of that is 750,000 divided 1.05 squared, which is then equal to 680,272. In your third period, we again have seven. $150,000 revenue, uh, and then the present value of that is equal to six forty seven four eight seven eight. And in the fourth period, the final period, we have revenue there of seven hundred fifty thousand again, but the present value of that is six one seven zero two seven. Do those calculations agree with, uh, I know I'm probably going a little fast just to finish up on time, but those calculations should agree with what you have. So then in part three, what you, what you do is simply sum these, sum these present values. So minus half a million, minus 952,000, plus 687, plus 647, plus 617, and calculate the sum of them. So the sum of their present values is equal to 492, 796. So, so we're going to take a look at what that means in the next class. What I'd like you to do over the weekend is it's helpful to repeat that calculation, but this time we talk value of 10%, 15%.